grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome today. We'll be looking at the invisible presence of the Lord with us today. The invisible presence of the Lord with us today. Uh, it's important to state at this point that, uh, in my opinion, the most uh, valuable treasure or asset that we have as believers in Christ Jesus is the presence of the Lord, the invisible presence of the Lord. I don't think there is any other treasure that could be compared to that in the life of any man, in the life of any believer. That is the Lord actually being with us. This is a great, great asset. This is a great asset. <laughs> I say it's a great asset because, I mean, assets are things you have that adds value to you. And um, the, value, the valuation or how valuable a company, an individual, a nation, or any organization can be in life is just a function of the worth of the assets that they have. That's why in some places it's called the net assets or um, what are the assets that they have basically. And for us as believers, I don't think there's any assets that actually that is more valuable than the presence of the Lord with us today um, because you could have cars, you could have houses and you could have fleets of aircraft but when you are asleep those things are actually not valuable to you because you go, you pass from the realm of the physical to another realm and something could happen there um, but here comes the presence of the Lord that whether we are asleep or awake as Psalm 121 that he that watcheth over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. So the invisible presence of the Lord. So we'll be looking at that today there is the visible presence of the Lord as well as the invisible presence of the Lord the visible presence of the Lord when something is invisible then we can say that okay uh, what's the the, the the value of his invisibility can be measured by maybe to some measure the visibility of that thing so there's the visible presence and the invisible presence the visible presence is actually the physical form that is what our human eyes can see and that was in the account of the four gospels God is invisible he dwells in unapproachable life but in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, 1 Timothy 3, 16 says that God was manifest in the flesh. John 1 says that the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So he made himself visible in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Isaiah, I think 45, God has said that God is a God that hides himself. I mean, but he has made himself visible. Hebrews chapter 1 says that the Son is the express image of the Father. So the visible presence of the Lord as well as his invisible presence. The four gospels are accounts of his invisible of his visible presence with men. They saw him, Peter, James, and John, and those that were around on the earth at that period in Israel. They saw him that uh, not everyone had a revelation of who he was. They thought he was just the son of a carpenter. But that was his visible presence in the midst of men. From Acts to Revelation until eternity uh, to eternity are uh, accounts of his invisible presence with us. So from the book of Acts, where in his resurrected form, in his ascended form, it's not just his visible presence that we have, but we have his invisible presence, which is actually what he desires uh, for us to have, which we will look at as we go further in today's study. So his invisible presence is actually what happened upon his resurrection, because First Corinthians 15, 45 says that the first Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, and Second Corinthians 3, 17 also says that now the Lord is the Spirit. So we have and Matthew 28, he has said that Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. So his goal and his uh, his desire actually was not just to be with men, to be with his disciples. His intention was to actually be with us in an invisible form, as of course, as the Spirit. Because while he was here, there, I mean, there are there are disadvantages of his visible presence in the four gospels though peter james and john every one of them were excited and we'll see that later on they were excited that they were with the lord the christ god manifest in the flesh but the lord had a greater uh, he had a greater dimension of his presence he wanted and they ate with him but he knew he was limited in his visible presence because if he was in uh, Bethany he could not be in Jerusalem he could not be in Samaria he was restricted because he was wearing the human flesh but today he feels everywhere with himself. From incarnation to his crucifixion, his presence was visible because he became a man for our redemption. He became a man for our ransom. The world became flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. 
from his resurrection his presence became invisible to his believers because he became a life-giving spirit to indwell us to dwell in our hearts for our transformation so in the flesh in his incarnation and all is true his human living and his crucifixion because it was the lamb of god is the sacrifice the eternal sacrifice for the whole of humanity it was in a physical form for our redemption and of course there are two sides to god's salvation to us man there's the redemption and there's the salvation salvation judicial redemption or the organic salvation judicial redemption just basically mean christ dying on the cross and to undo the work of adam what adam did by disobeying god so he became the lamb of god to pay the trespass and to pay the uh, the penalty for our sin and our trespass in adam so the organic salvation actually now has to do with christ coming inside of us to live in us that's why it says christ lives in me uh we crucify with christ yet not i but christ lives in me that christ in you the hope of glory so of course that organic salvation aspect could not come to reality except actually that uh, he went through death and resurrection thus john 12 24 which says except a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die it abide by itself but if it dies it produces many grain so upon his resurrection his presence became invisible and it actually became more valuable and more real to us it's interesting as mortal men we seem to like the visibility of the lord if, if we were to choose if they were to ask and take a sample of believers say no i rather prefer him visibly with me but really uh his, his invisible presence is actually much more valuable than his visible presence according to the lord he said it's better for you that i go away if i don't go i can't come back in another form as the spirit so his, his invisible presence in the eyes of god is much more valuable because though we don't see it um our go our prayer is that the lord will make us more conscious of it sometimes people uh, as believers growing up you will be thinking that maybe certain verses of god god is more present with them than with us or than believers or a young believer that those who've worked with the lord for years that they actually carry more presence of the lord i mean we have this mindset i don't know if there's any part in scripture that support because sometimes we are made to believe that oh the god is more with this certain men of god or women of god these verses than with other no i don't think so my personal opinion that god was with everybody the, the difference is like some are just more aware and more conscious of his presence of course by spending time with him in fellowship with him he said my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow so the more time we're spending with the lord in fellowship the more we are conscious of his presence doesn't mean that his presence increases it's like saying that there are certain human beings that have more oxygen than other human beings no no it's still the same oxygen some maybe by default we're just to breathe but you take the case of the presence of god because certain vessels certain uh saints of god we don't enjoy his presence in the same measure that's what i mean actually that by our work with the lord our relationship and fellowship with him he makes himself uh, he, he gives us the grace to be more conscious of his presence so going ahead as well because his presence is invisible today is called the pneumatic christ the church fathers have said this in the earlier videos that the church fathers in the second and the third century they came up with this term the pneumatic christ that is the christ in resurrection that is first corinthians 15 45 that now the lord that the last adam became a life-giving spirit second corinthians 3 7 now the lord is the spirit also in revelation 2 3 the lord jesus christ calls himself the spirit seven times so the and efficient chapter 4 which we look at where it says that he that descended is the same that ascended that he might fill all things with himself pneuma in greek means air so uh, they count uh, they brought out the word they didn't want to say things like the spiritual christ because it will mean that okay there's an unspiritual christ and in the wisdom god gave to them they brought out the phrase the pneumatic christ that is the christ as the spirit his presence his invisible presence is far better than his visible presence because it is inward vital organic and more real so his visible presence it could only be our savior an outward savior a savior from the outside not from the inside and actually many things that bother us are coming from the heart the scripture says that guard your heart with all diligence i think proverb 4 that out of it are the issues of life 
and at Proverbs 4, 18, thereabout. And so, out of the heart are the issues of life. So, a lot of the battles we face are actually coming from our heart, our mindset. So, God's intention is that He was coming to live in our heart. So, He could only be an indwelling Savior in us by His invisible presence, which actually was how uh, we we take we we are blessed. We bless God that He is pneumatic. That is the Christ that fills all things everywhere with Himself. Only air is probably everywhere. I mean, speaking of creation, and actually air is uh, a picture, is a shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Second Corinthians chapter three verse seventeen. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and also Second Corinthians three eighteen. It says that as we behold Him as in the glass, we are being transformed from glory to glory, even by the Lord Spirit or the Spirit of the Lord. Now that and we have a different video for that. Christ as the Spirit, and we pray as the Lord leading, we will upload that. Looking at the scriptures as well, the three are not one. Sometimes someone might wonder. Um, you mentioning the Lord as the Spirit. Don't we have the? Yes, we have the Spirit of God. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God the Father. First John five seven says these three are one. And the Father, that there are three that bear records in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. God is a mystery. Uh, you could listen to the video or watch the video. Uh, God as the Father, God as the Son, God as the Spirit. We did a lot of more uh, teaching and looking at a lot of scriptures concerning that. Now that it is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9 to 10, how the church fathers came up with the term the pneumatic Christ. Now that he ascended, what is it? But he but that he also descended first into the lower part of the earth and through his death and resurrection, the grain of wheat. He that descended is the same also that ascended in his resurrection up far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So he fills all things with himself now in his ascended state, in his resurrected state, in his exalted glorified state. He fills all things with himself, hence the term the pneumatic Christ. So there is no place he is not because he is everywhere. What a joy, what a joy. So that's why we enjoy his, his invisible presence. There's nowhere the Lord is not. <laughs> the Lord is everywhere, but he doesn't manifest himself everywhere. Where he's glorified, he manifests himself in the church, wherever you are. So when we are worshipping, there are things that we do that trigger his manifestation. <laughs> and like when we are praying, when we are studying the word, when uh, we are waiting on him, many of the spiritual activities. And he could also manifest himself negatively where he's not being glorified. For example, uh, maybe in places where they are doing things that are against his will, uh, he could manifest himself in a negative, probably in a place where they are planning evil against the saints of God. God will show himself as a consuming fire. For three and a half years, he had been with his disciples visibly in the flesh and they had gotten used to that but he told them he was going and would come back again into them. This is John 14, 20. He said I'm coming. He was actually, he said he was going but his going actually was his coming. So, he was going and he told them he was going but he was coming back again. He had to come back in another form. He was taking his flesh. We believe that he was taking his flesh, that is the, the son of man, to the cross to be crucified crucified and now to be resurrected and now come back as the life-giving spirit that way we can have him in our heart there was no shortcut to that he had to go through death and resurrection it's like a grain of wheat for example a grain any grain any any seed for example and you want to plant the seed in the soil the seed if the seed can speak say i'm going but the seed can say i'm going but i'm coming back <laughs> but i'm going but i'm going through death to be buried in the ground but i'm going to resurrect to be to produce many fruits so his going was his coming as well in another form that's hence we have the spirit of the resurrected lord the spirit of jesus christ the spirit of christ the spirit of god he came back to them upon his resurrection and bred himself into them as the spirit the holy spirit john 20 john 20 22 so he did breathe into his disciples and said receive ye the spirit the holy spirit and so he became in them the spirit of life which we have in romans chapter 8 as well so he became the spirit of life in his disciples but of course it wasn't just the spirit of life to be in them he also wanted them to receive or host because they were there in our state to host or have the spirit of power which came on the day of pentecost so there's the spirit of life essentially to help us in our communion with God, to relate with Him, to be able to be one spirit with the Lord. Then there's the spirit of power which came in act, which is actually to help us to carry out the work of the Great Commission. And actually the Church Fathers came up with the term, the essential spirit and the economical spirit. The essential spirit is the spirit of life in John 20, 22. The economical spirit is in Acts when the Holy Ghost came. He said, don't go anywhere until you are endued with power. So the economical spirit 
helps us to carry out the Great Commission. And actually, in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, you remember as well in the Gospels that he was filled with the Spirit without measure. And when he started his ministry at age 30, the Spirit came upon him. And so, the essential Spirit was, was filled with the Spirit without measure. He cast out demon by the Spirit. But the Spirit that came upon him is the economical Spirit. The Church Fathers called it that helps us to... It's still the same Spirit. We don't have two different Spirits. We don't have three different Spirits. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 4 says, There's one Spirit. There's one body. There's one Spirit. So, He came in us as the Spirit of life. What a great joy for what the Lord is doing in His invisible presence. His visible presence is everywhere today. There is no place he's not. There's no place the Lord is not. And that's why David said, I think in Psalm 139, that if he goes down to the uh, to the to, to the abyss, the Lord will be there anywhere. The Lord fills everywhere with himself. There is no place God is not. Wherever we are, the Lord's invisible, invisible presence is always with us, though we are often unconscious of it. There's no place where I as a believer, you as a believer, can be that the Lord is not there. It's just sometimes we feel we might have a sense that ah, it looks dark. It seems as if God is not with me. And sometimes people pray that God be with me. And that God, uh, as I go for this particular proposal, please be with me. It's okay. Not trying to knock anything down. It's almost, uh, it will be laughable if, for example, somebody is hearing another human being praying that, uh, that oh, air. Hey, let, the, let oxygen be with me as I'm going. Wherever I get there, let oxygen be present. Of course, oxygen and air, they are everywhere. But of course, we can pray for him to make his presence tangible, to manifest himself. I'm not saying we can't pray for the presence of the Lord, but in some eyes, I was guilty of that as well. Not that I'm making fun of anything, but I was guilty. I always meant that Lord be with me. But the Lord is in us. He's with us. He said, Lord, I'm with you always. So we can also pray that it will make, his, it will make us conscious and more aware of his presence so wherever we are the lost presence is with us in the home when we are asleep is with us when we are driving is with us and what a joy what a joy lo i am with you always even to the end of the world from matthew 28 so we can see that the lord himself is with us in every every part of our being anywhere he desires to fellowship with us what a great joy but this uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, is one spirit with him. So he became a lot of mysterious things in his resurrection. A part of it is now the Lord being the spirit. So in his invisible form, we are one spirit with the Lord, an organic union. We are members of Christ, members of his body. Our body is for him. He is for our body. Oh, what a joy. First Corinthians chapter 6. So you see the joy that we have in his invisible presence. He could not be, we could not be one spirit with him except he went through death and resurrection. Someone says that, why are you always talking about this death and resurrection? Why death and resurrection? It's because there is no life outside this death and resurrection. First Corinthians 1 tells us that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe, but to us is the power of God. So, and Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. So, we always go back as believers to the crucifixion of Christ. That's where we draw our life from. Leviticus 17, 11 says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. So, Paul said that I desire to know nothing among except Christ and Him crucified. We draw our life as believers from His crucifixion and His resurrection because everything, we, were, we, are, we are made children of God by His resurrection. 1 Peter 1, 3. So, there's nothing we have in this kingdom. It's almost like someone saying that... Uh, what is what is the value of blood to a human being? <laughs> blood is everything. Blood circulates through the body. What's the value of air? Because our own spiritual blood or air or life as believers actually has to come from from his death and resurrection. That's why in John 12, 24, he said it that except he falls down to the grain falls to the and die, it's abide by itself. But if it grows, if it dies and, and resurrects, it produces many fruits. So our life as believers continuously is that we are going back to his death, the message of the cross, the message of his resurrection that's where we draw strength from that's where every part of our life our prayer life anything we want to talk about in christianity that is the foundation no other foundation can anyone lay except that which is known in christ jesus this is second, second Corinthians chapter 13. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. It's mighty in us. It's not in us in the physical form. <laughs> it's when people see me or see you, they don't see two, three different people. But it's with us in, the, in an invisible form. It's one spirit with us. What a joy. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. I think also Second Timothy chapter 4, 22, there about talks about the Lord being with your spirit. Now the Lord be with your spirit. So the Lord is one spirit with us. Know you know that you are 
know you not your own self how that Jesus Christ is in you? It's a question Paul was asking. That don't you know why you're seeking for uh, to, 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 why are you thinking it's only me God is in? That the Lord Jesus Christ is in every one of us as believers. He actually prayed for this which we will see uh, I think the last page of this presentation that his prayer in John 17 23 and 26 was that he will be in us, he will be in us and what a reality that today we have the invisible presence of the Lord with us today. His, his, his invisible presence is more valuable than his visible presence because his invisible presence a lot of things is doing on our behalf a lot is transforming us is he regenerates us it sanctifies us it transforms us is working in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure what a great joy what a great joy visibly is in heaven is in heaven visibly is at the right hand of the throne of majesty invisibly is in our heart someone say how can that be there's no answer for that. <laughs> that is mysterious. God is omnipresent. Christ is omnipresent. So he said in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. So he's in heaven and at the same time he's in our heart. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Visibly it's in every heart, in every believer's heart. How could, he, how could we live the Christian life without him living in us? It's impossible. It's just a joke to think we can mimic Christ. It's impossible. Could you imagine a monkey trying to mimic a human being? The more the monkey is trying to mimic a human being, the funnier and more laughable the monkey becomes. He could be getting it right, but everybody knows that you are not a human being. So there's no way we could live the Christian life. The Christian life is simply, in my own definition, Christ living through a believer. Christ living through a human vessel. And that's actually what happened in the book of Acts when they were first, when the saints were first, they, they were called the people of the way. And before the word was cut to them, these are little Christ, they were called Christians then, so in Antioch. So, we as Christians, we can't live this Christian life except Christ is living in us. There are many things he tells us in the New Testament to do. For example, we should love one another as he has loved us. He went to the cross to die for us. Ask me, do you think the mortal hand, the flesh, can live, can love his neighbor as he loved us in, to the point of death? No. He said, without me, you can do nothing. He has to come in us and now live in us by his spirit. He said, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He said, Abide in me, and I in you, for without me you can do nothing. So that's the joy that we have today. We can only live the Christian life except Christ comes inside of us and through his invisible presence is able to enable us to walk in us, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That's why all the glory we go back to him. Abide in me and I in you. What a joy, what a joy. We should always abide in him and he will abide in us. He said, As my word abides in you, then he, whatever we ask he we do as his word abides in us he abides in us as well because his word and himself they are one he said let the word of christ dwell in you richly colossians chapter 3 so the more of his word we are having in us the more we are able to be aware and to be conscious of the presence of the lord what a joy so after his resurrection, he was with disciple. He was with the disciples for forty days in a physical form. So after his resurrection for forty days, and he was doing something strange. He had been with them for three and a half years, and he had trained them in a lot of things. But he knew, no matter what he was telling them to do, he knew they were going to fail at it. Except he comes inside of them, and that was why in John fourteen he was telling them repeat John fourteen fifteen sixteen his validatory speeches and his teachings and seventeen his prayer his closing prayer, which we believe is a good prayer in the Bible and that he was coming to live in them. So upon his resurrection, for 40 days after his resurrection, he was still with the disciples. But this time, they had two of his presence. He thought to his death, it was only the visible presence they had. Now, he knew that they were now, that believers were now going to be enjoying, be experiencing his invisible presence. And just like any other person or in many things, you like to be a transition. If you are making a sharp transition from one method to another method, so within those period those 40 days it was a training ground you might want to call it in our own opinion like a training school that he was training them on his visible and invisible presence so sometimes he will withdraw his presence sometimes he will reveal his presence this is upon his resurrection he would appear to them and again he would take his presence because we believe he was training them to get used to get accustomed to his new presence that, look my presence will no longer be with you in a physical form <laughs> i will not be here you will not be seen but i'll be with you that's why he came into the room on resurrection he didn't open their the doors and, and he just came in, in there and they were surprised to see me. So he, he was invariably he was telling them that look, you will not have me physically here, you will not be seeing me, but wherever you are, my invisible presence will be there. My invisible presence is even mightier 
than my visible presence. So what a joy. So wherever we are, no matter what you're doing, you're watching this teaching, for example, the Lord is with you. The Lord is in you. The Lord is in me. The Lord is, is teaching every one of us. It's impossible for any human being to be coming out and be teaching this, except the Lord is the one doing his work through us, the vessels of God. So in any area the Lord has called you, in any walk of life the Lord has called you, his goal and his intention as his redeemed, as his believer, is that you will give him more space for him to increase in your life so that he will be the one actually living through you. It doesn't matter whatever occupation you are in, as long as the Lord has sent you there and is adding value to humanity, whether as an architect, whether as a lawyer, whether as a sport person, a person, a pastor, a politician, a president, a senator, in any work or capacity you have, a wife, a husband, a child, a parent, the Lord's intention is that through his invisible presence, he will actually be living through you. So that when men come across us, they will feel and they will experience the aroma of Christ. They can reap Christ from our life. He can manifest himself towards them. He, the body only manifests the desires of the head and we are the members of his body. So he expresses himself on the surface of this earth through his believers. So wherever we are in our workplace, in any walk of life where we are in, whether in the church, in our neighborhood, we are actually the presence of Christ in that area. We are the body of Christ. We are the members of his body. John the Baptist could say that he is not the Christ. He said that in John chapter. He said it's not the Christ and he was right that of course there's one among you which you don't know. We, I don't think I can say that my personal, I can say that I'm not the Christ in an environment. I'll be insulting the Lord because I'm a member of his body. Could you imagine if my hand could go somewhere? Let's just imagine for example my, my hand say, ah, my, that this hand is separate from my person. No, no, no. The hand is a member of me. So wherever you are, you are the presence of the Lord there as a saint of God, as a child of God. That's why we are the ambassadors of Christ. We are his legs, we are his feet, we are his eyes, we are his, we are members of his body. So because he's with us in an invisible form and what a joy. If he's going to heal anybody around maybe you, your neighbor, someone that comes to you, he's going to do it through us, through his saints. When we lay our hands, it's not just our hands, it's the hands of the Lord on such because we are members of his body and he's walking in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. What a great joy. So after his resurrection, he trained them for 40 days. He was appearing and disappearing or better put or better still he was making his presence visible and invisible he was withdrawing his visible presence he was because he was training them he didn't just want it to be a sharp maybe transition so he was training them he would disappear or he, would, he would disappear means that he's going away so i'm not really a big fan of the word disappear but we still have to use it but what we mean is like he was withdrawing his presence and at the same time was making his presence visible it's almost like the light switch or electricity you switch off the light it doesn't mean the electricity no the electricity is there but it's just that it's being switched off but of course the electrical currents are still there and it's being switched on so he was getting them he was getting them to get accustomed to his new presence he was training them to get used and accustomed to his invisible this new invisible presence also the disciples had eaten to treasure his visibility his visible presence but he wanted something better as he couldn't get into them except by his visible presence there was no way he could come into us except he became a spirit so he that is joined to the lord is one spirit in that first Timothy, first corinthians 6 17 we looked at and also now the lord is a spirit second corinthians 3 17 his invisible presence was impossible except he became a life-giving spirit through death and resurrection first corinthians 15 45 the first 1545 the first adam became uh, a living soul the last adam became a life-giving spirit and before that verse 45 um, and the holy spirit had actually mentioned that whatever you sow is not is not ripped in the same way so he was the one that was sown in corruption that was now ripped in glory he had a physical body and upon his resurrection a glorified body what a joy what a joy so what a joy to have the invisible presence of the lord with us so he prayed this in john for uh, this john 14 20 before he prayed in John 17 in that day he was referring to the day of his resurrection or upon his resurrection you will know that I'm in my father and you in me and I in you he could not be in them he was with them in his physical form in his incarnated form but he could not come inside of us except in his resurrected and his glorified form in his flesh he could only be among them or with them he could be with them or among them or but never 
in them. He couldn't come inside. It wasn't possible for him to come inside of all. There was that, the way was not just there. He, that's why he said, except a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die. He had to be the grain of wheat to die, to pass through death and resurrection before he could come inside to live in us. So his prayers in John 17, 23, 25, 23 and 26 was that to be in all his believers. He kept on saying it to the Father that I in them, I in them, because he knew that there was no way we could experience what he died for. There was no way we could carry out our purpose on earth or his purpose for our life on the earth except he comes inside of us to live in us, to regenerate us, to sanctify us, to transform us, to conform us to his image, to carry out his great work in our life so that we will be the living epistles, we will be his living epistles, we will be aroma everywhere on the surface of the earth so today we've been able to look at the invisible presence of the Lord. We said that there's the visible and the invisible presence of the Lord. The visible presence of the Lord is actually in the four Gospels where he was here in the physical form. God manifests in the flesh. The Word became flesh and is invisible. And upon his death and resurrection, he now be in we now experience what is called his invisible presence. We said his invisible presence is more real, it's more organic, it's more vital because he's living in our heart. Wherever we are, whether we are asleep, whether we are awake, anywhere we are, there's no place Christ is not. We said the church fathers came up with the term the pneumatic Christ, which meant um, pneuma as in air and in the Greek context. That means the Christ that fills everywhere with himself from that Ephesians chapter 4. We said that he trained his disciples to get used to his invisible presence because he knew that they were in you. It was a new thing and he wanted to bring them into that realm. Hence, he was appearing and disappearing for 40 days after his resurrection and um, before his ascension in Acts chapter 1. So what a joy that today we have the presence of the Lord with us today. It's okay to pray for the presence. I didn't say you should not pray for the presence, but we could ask that we, that the Lord will give us the grace to be more conscious and to be more aware of his presence. There is nowhere we are not where he's not. He said in um, Hebrews chapter 13 that, that, I, that we never leave you nor forsake you. I will never the Amplified Version, I will never, never leave you without help. So there is no situation you could be in, I could be in, any one of us could be in where the Lord is not with us. He's working in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He's not just sitting in heaven waiting for the trumpet to blow for him to come uh, for the rapture. No, he's in heaven and at the same time he's in our heart interceding for us. Romans chapter 8 is in our heart making his home in us. Ephesians chapter 3. That's why the prayers in uh, the New Testament, Ephesians 1, he said that the Lord will give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened to know the hope of his calling for our life and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. That is our eyes of understanding needs to be open. We are blind as believers. That's our greatest, I believe that's one of our greatest uh, <laughs> the sickness that we have, spiritual blindness. That's why I told Paul, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to go and open their eyes. That's why many prayers in the New Testament is that for our eyes of understanding to be open. Also in Ephesians 3, the prayer he gave, he said that we may be strengthened with might by spirit in our inner man, that Christ will make his home in our heart by faith. And what a joy that Christ making his home in our heart. He could do that, he couldn't do that except Except it became a life-giving spirit to live in us. Also, the prayer in Ephesians in Hebrews chapter 13. I love that. That now the God of peace make you perfect in every good work, working in you that which is well pleasing in the sight through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a joy to the invisible presence of the Lord. Hallelujah to the invisible presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.